MBA Spotlight, our first top MBA virtual fair hosted by Chima Club. So we will have top schools joining us every single day to talk about their programs. We'll have admissions experts weighing in on your profiles and also current student panels talking about their MBA experiences. I wanted to introduce Jake Kohler from, from the Wharton School to kick us off. Jake, why don't you take it away? Awesome. Uh, well, thank you so much, Suvik. And uh, I want to just acknowledge right off the bat, like I appreciate the GMAT Club and this whole MBA program. So thank you for having us aboard. Uh, my name is Jake Kohler. I'm the director of the Ken Mullis and Julie Tappet Mullis Advanced Access Program, which is a deferred enrollment program at the Wharton MBA program. Uh, but I'm a member of the full-time MBA admissions committee. And I'm joined today by my, my colleague, Marcy Bevan, who will introduce herself briefly as well. Hi, I'm the Director of Admissions of the Lauder Institute, which is a joint degree program between Wharton and Lauder. The students get an MBA at the same time they get an MA in International Studies, and there's also a language component to our program. So I look forward to answering your questions if you have any. Awesome. Thank you, Marcy. Uh, so what we're gonna do for the next little bit, uh, I'm gonna do my best to run through our presentation in about 15 minutes time, uh, providing an opportunity to talk about the full MBA program, including some of our joint degrees, including Lauder. And then after that period of time, Marcy and I will be available through the duration of our uh, remaining time to answer questions. Uh, but to jump into to Wharton as an institution and as a program, these three, driving principles that you see at the bottom, incubating ideas, creating leaders, driving insights, occupy all of the things we do. And we believe really strongly that every part of your experience from the academic standpoint, the student life standpoint, career development and leadership, all should be reinforcing these same notions because all of those different elements are interconnected in our experience for our students. And before I go into the, the depth of like, the actual features of our program, I wanna give a quick overview of what our current program and what our current school looks like. Um, there are over 1,700 MBA students in the Wharton program at any given time. Uh, that 1,700 number includes both our first year and second year students. Uh, but I'd be remiss if I didn't note right off the bat that we have nearly 100,000 living Wharton alumni that are part of that experience as well in many ways. And obviously we'll talk about that later um, as it goes on. The stats you see at the bottom of the screen are actually uh, elements and statistics from last year's MBA class. Uh, so the, our current uh, rising second year students uh, was about 46% female, 36% students of color and representative of over 64 countries. And if you take that 64 countries and actually look at all the years combined of the program, we're approaching closer to that 100 uh, countries represented within our entire program at any moment. The PowerPoint itself is going to hit each of those four buckets I noted earlier, academics, leadership, career, student life, share how they're interconnected, and then we'll give some uh, insights about the application process at Wharton as well. Um, but before we get too deep, what I want to start with is talking about your experience as a member of your class. And, and we believe, and one of the things that's distinctive about the Wharton experience is that you are really going to be in control of much of the work that you end up spending time in. Uh, it's not totally free form, but we give structured flexibility so you get to decide how you want to approach your academic dealings, your leadership, your involvements and you get to be a leader within not only your own experience, but in the greater experience of the community as well. We look at our MBA students as the leaders within the entire Wharton School. And within that learning, within uh, your experience, you're immediately gonna be surrounded by five other members of what we call a learning team, which as we get through the academics, we'll talk about your core classes and those six individuals, you'll actually take all of your fixed core classes with. So all the projects that you have in your first year are actually gonna be with the same five other people. And this group of six, this learning team is intentionally made to come from diverse backgrounds geographically, from an industry and professional standpoint, from a job function standpoint, um, from a racial and ethnic standpoint, 
because we believe in the value of having such diversity of minds all contributing to help form ideas. You're, within your learning team, those six people are part of a larger group of 72 students that make up that academic core unit that you experience most of your first year courses with. And then within your cohort, you're part of a broader cluster, which is in many ways the social home of your experience. And a lot of your advisors are actually shared amongst that cluster. In every single one of our classes, we have four clusters. So there's 864 students, which is one of the largest MBA programs uh, that you'll find in the US. But what this uh, slide is showing is how there's smaller features to make that 864 number really manageable. And we have very intentional ways of making sure we are connecting you amongst all the members of that class. So that way it doesn't feel like you have to try to meet 900 people right off the bat. You're engaging with a number of people in really meaningful and intentional ways throughout your two year program. I'll dive in a little bit more about the curriculum and the academic nature, because this really is one of the most important parts of any MBA program. It's what skills and knowledge you're going to create. And our curriculum is set up in a way that you take 19 credit units over the course of your two years. And I'm just going to use uh, CUs as a, you know, your basic unit moving forward to describe the classes. Um, about half of those CUs are from the core. Uh, so classes that include both a fixed core, which uh, every student takes, as well as some flexible to give you the opportunity to select whichever courses make the most sense for you. But the other half of your degree is actually built around the types of courses, the skills, the knowledge areas that you are most interested in. And one of the other distinctive parts about the Wharton experience is that we have great, a great non-disclosure policy. So we, we want our students to be able to take classes that are most interesting to them, that are gonna best help them for their future without concern that taking a certain course and getting a certain grade in a course that they might not have had previous exposure to could negatively impact their future job um, opportunities. So that grade non-disclosure gives you the confidence that you can take that course in an area that you've never had exposure to that's going to challenge you more so but give you the skills and knowledge that's gonna make you far more successful in the future instead of taking the easiest classes or the classes that are most meaningfully gonna get you the best job. And we think that this methodology, giving you the skills and knowledge through the right challenge is actually better for your long-term successes. Um, I'm gonna fly by this, but this, uh, we can talk more and we can always share more information about the difference between our fixed and flexible core. I do wanna highlight that we have nine, 19 different majors that we offer within the Wharton experience. And uh, the reality is most of our students decide which major they will pursue or finally have in their final semester. Um, it's very easy to actually complete a major within the Wharton experience. And there's tons of overlap with the core and with other electives. So this isn't the driver for a lot of our students right off the get go. You see that there's uh, about six different gears, those blue gears next to a handful of our majors. That's an indication that the major qualifies for the STEM OPT extension. Uh, so those six majors, business analytics, business economics and public policy, which we call BEP on campus, business, energy, environment, and sustainability or BEES, operations, information, decisions, quantitative finance, statistics, those six all qualify again for the STEM OPT extension. We also have over 200 different electives that we offer for our students. And again, I talked about the importance of being able to take courses that are gonna be most meaningful in helping you capture and learn different skills and knowledge that's gonna be really powerful for your future. And this is showing you just the diversity and the range of the classes we're offering year in and year out. Um, and it shows the power and the, the diversity of thought and uh, development that our students will have. Marcy uh, noted earlier, so she's a member of the Lauder uh, Institute, uh, which is that combined MBA, MA, and international studies, which is an incredibly powerful experience and something that's ingrained into the entire MBA experience. We also offer a number of other joint and integrated programs, including the Carry JD MBA program, which is a three-year combined JD and MBA. We have a healthcare management program within the MBA program. 
And we also have joint degree programs associated with 15 other schools, even outside of the University of Pennsylvania, as well as including the University of Pennsylvania. So examples could be um, our relationship with Harvard Kennedy School um, or with uh, SAIS and other institutions so that way you can get more out of that degree program while you're studying instead of having two separate degrees throughout your career. And I'm just gonna give you a couple quick snapshots of how students navigate their curricular space. So you'll see here that a student like Jalise who is interested in entrepreneurship and innovation didn't fixate only on entrepreneurship and innovation. She used her core to complete some of those classes and then wanted to make sure that she got exposed to a variety of other areas, knowing that that was gonna be the most meaningful to her when she left uh, the Wharton's uh, space. And that helped her. I spoke to Julie earlier this summer when she was connecting with some of our recently admitted students. And Julie's talked about the importance of getting this diversity of skills, diversity of uh, curricular opportunities when she initiated her own startup and since uh, she's moved back into consulting, but how all of the curricular work that she did allowed her to be successful both in her own startup as well as going into consulting again. Just showing you some other diversity. Sean is an example. You see there's some parallels, but Sean added a little bit more management coursework to his. He, you can see that he also took a non wharton class over the course of his term as well. And that's ways to get exposure around the institution for anybody who's interested in Lauder, again, uh, Nicole here is an example of showing how the Lauder program is integrated into the broader Wharton curriculum. So the Lauder Institute has its own core and that core overlapped with the remainder of the Wharton experience still gives you the opportunity to take specialized and elective courses throughout your time. Um, so taking advantage of one of these joint degree programs is never going to prohibit you in some of those other really powerful experiences. Whether or not you participate in something like Lauder, there's plenty of ways to get international exposure. And I'm not going to highlight all of these, the Global Modular Courses and the Global Immersion Program and our INSEAD Alliance. But I do want to share that that opportunity to get exposure, to spend time in either developing countries and emerging markets or in other uh, developed industries in other countries, just to see the practice and understand what it is to be a multinational leader or just have exposure to that multinational understanding is really powerful in your time. And it's something that we encourage and advise all of our students to get involved in, in whatever ways. And some of these programs are only about three days long. Some are, are full semester based, but they give you that opportunity to, again, get that multinational and international exposure during your two year program. Leadership is also a huge component and the McNulty leadership programs offer a variety of different resources ranging from intensive workshops to uh, P3 to executive coaching, all of which are just are afforded to you an opportunity through tuition and some have additional costs to them. But these fellowship programs, these ventures all give you that opportunity to get exposed and develop more meaningful in some of those soft skills that are really powerful. And just to show just how many students are involved, in any given year, we're seeing over 900 students, nearly 1,000 students participating between our two classes. And if you were actually to take that number and see what percentage of our total students any given year have participated in a McNulty program, you'd see that it's you know approaching uh, all of our students are involved in some form or fashion of McNulty, and some take advantage in a lot of ways uh, as well. One of the really powerful experiences are these stretch experiences, which I highlighted earlier. So that could include the FDNY intensive or Quantico military intensive, where you actually go through a day of uh, the fire of the New York Fire Department's uh, training program or the Marine Corps training program, and give, and pushing yourself into emotional and psychological spaces that you've never been involved with, with before, probably. But this gives you a powerful. Uh, foundation to learn how you thrive and can develop in very stressful situations. And these are skills that our alumni constantly talk about some of the most meaningful experiences during their MBA um, time at Wharton. And this paired with the academics and the other uh, social and community elements are really powerful to our students. We also offer to every single student the opportunity um, for executive coaching. 
which actually takes advantage of a 360 degree assessment, allowing you to self-reflect on your experiences, allowing members of your learning team to share about their experiences with you and the ways that you thrive as a leader and as a contributing member of a team. It also allows you to reach out to former colleagues and former supervisors before your MBA to get their understanding and their input. And then your executive coach will actually help you set goals and develop a plan that will extend through your time in the MBA and in your post MBA career. So that way you can continue growing and developing even after your time at Wharton has completed. And many of our students are finding that their uh, successes and promotions post MBA and post their first job out of their MBA is partly due to this work in executive coaching. That pairs really well with the understanding of career management. And the 30 different industries that you see represented here are sharing where we have in individual advisors um, for you as a student. We have a lot of students who have interest in a couple different areas, uh, but what I want you to know is when you uh, are interested in an industry, you're gonna have both a one-on-one uh, -on -one and a student-focused advisor, as well as their counterpart, which is an employer relationship manager for every single one of these industries. And that allows our MBA career management team to both develop and create a variety of different opportunities through that employer relation arm, as well as be able to cr directly cr provide you with different understandings and different areas of knowledge from that advisement standpoint. And they work as a team as part of that entire MBA career management cohort um, to foster and develop our students through their MBA period. We look at the different industries in, in, in two terms, one being mature and the other being enterprise. And to just give you some background of what that actually looks like, um, you know, consulting, investment banking are the mature industries. Industries that basically every year in the first two weeks of January are selecting and interviewing in the same form or fashion that they always have. Um, but we have a lot of students who are interested in what we call enterprise types of uh, recruiting opportunities that come about kind of on a whim. It's whenever they are in need of a new role, that is when they're pursuing uh, their different candidates and opportunities. And then there are a variety, this is a continuum, there's a variety of different industries that kind of fall somewhere in between. And our career management office is there to not only provide you that, uh, the resource and the connections and the advisement and create connections for you, but over the course of your first year, they're actually actively providing you with the different skills and knowledge about these variety of industries and different strategies to be successful through your uh, first year internship search and your second year uh, post MBA employment search. And those skills, that maturation of skills and knowledge about these different industries and about approaches to be the most successful through that is part of the educational experience you're going to have, again, leading you to the success. And the fact that we've had 100% of our students who are interested in an uh, MBA internship getting that internship during, uh, in between their first and second year over the past three years, and then 98% uh, success rate uh, for students getting a, uh, a full-time offer right at the time of uh, graduation is all a semblance of uh, and an indication of the successes of the way our program operates. And uh, these different images, these logos are sharing where at least two members of last year's graduating class have landed. And you can see the diversity of industries and job functions that come here. You see some of the top private equity firms in here. You see a variety of consulting firms, some um, uh, consumer products and goods, you see some other uh, financial companies, et cetera. And this diversity of big tech and different industries is giving you that confidence of where many of our students are finding themselves. There are a variety of students who will make their own companies as well. And not everybody is desiring to even go into uh, a already formed company. So the variety of resources that form this entrepreneurial ecosystem between different funds and different contests um, and grant monies awarded to our students gives them that opportunity to start their, uh, their entrepreneurial ventures during their MBA experience, as well as be able to have success even afterwards. 
Uh, I'm really excited and we're all really excited that this upcoming year, we're actually gonna open our first ever dedicated space for entrepreneurship on campus. Uh, the top left corner, you'll see Tengen Hall, which is a 70,000 square foot facility that will have a uh, pop-up retail space within it. It's gonna have incubation spaces and maker spaces, a test kitchen within it. And all of these are gonna provide and leapfrog the opportunities that we've previously been able to provide our students on the entre entrepreneurial front. Um, the variety of students who have are, you probably are even aware of some of the successful startups that have come out of the Wharton MBA. Um, I'm wearing my Warby Parker glasses right now. I shave with Harry's and a lot of people are familiar with those comp, you know, more household name ones. Uh, but I do wanna highlight, there's one towards the bottom called Clove which most people might not be aware of, but Clove is actually a specially designed shoe for healthcare workers. And it actually came from a, uh, a Wharton 2019 MBA graduate. And they launched just about six, seven months ago. And obviously about halfway through after their launch, they realized that um, the, the whole dynamic of our world changed uh, with co the COVID-19 pandemic. Uh, but Co Clove has actually been in the news recently because as early as March, they were one of the first companies to actually start donating free pairs of their shoes to nurses and to other healthcare providers um, in those early days of COVID when the test centers were just opening up around the country and around the world. And they've seen a lot of success in how so many of those uh, different uh, healthcare providers who in, over the course of a week effectively walk and move around uh, in excess of a marathon distance and how much comfort and how their back pain and how other parts of their leg uh, health and foot health has actually improved as a result of close. So just sharing another example of a very new startup coming out of Horton. Another huge part of the experience and one of the things we take a lot of pride in is the student life and student involvement. And where I talked earlier about the importance of that grade non-disclosure, giving you the confidence to take classes that you're um, that you want to develop skills in, and not worried about just getting that top grade, your involvement around the community is another really powerful way to grow during your time at, at Wharton. So we have a number of students who take advantage and are leading conferences that are beyond just the Wharton sphere and the Penn sphere, but are impactful and bring in world leaders uh, across the globe and other industry leaders from around the country and globe. And our students who are involved in that, it also gives you the confidence that you can pursue and maybe dedicate the extra 10 hours towards one of these conferences and split the balance between, you know, a midterm studying and your uh, development of one of these conferences or cultivation of different clubs. And we want you to, again, feel that you're able to use all of these different avenues to grow as an individual and leader throughout your time and not any one of those being the most meaningful or the most important experience. You get to decide that based on your motivations during your MBA. And that our community as a whole believes in this idea of belonging. Um, that we're obviously a very rich and diverse uh, community of all different backgrounds, industry, ethnic, religious, culturally, um, hobby wise. And we want our students to be all know that there's space for them to belong in multiple areas around our community. And that's the importance of the way that we build our entire space. Um, and that allows them to, to utilize both the Wharton campus, which you see just pop up there, as well as the entire city of Philadelphia as part of their home in this two year program. On the right, you actually see where most of our students live towards the hub, the center area of uh, Philadelphia, which is, you know, this walk is a miles distance. So you, having the opportunity to both be on a campus, which is beautiful and stunning within the uh, city, as well as spend really meaningful time in the city and utilize the entire city of Philadelphia as almost like a college town is wonderful, especially when Philadelphia is the sixth largest metropolitan area in the country. We've also dedicated spaces around Center City, closer to where our students are living, so that way they don't always need to necessarily go back to campus to meet in Wharton spaces. So uh, the third bubble that just popped up is a center called 2401 Walnut, which is close to where most of our students live, and it's in, you know on the way towards Wharton, but that's where a lot of the student life offices, there's different meeting spaces, group spaces, and other opportunities for you to engage and network with different students on campus without needing to walk a mile to campus, you can walk all the four blocks to
to, uh, to 2401. So I've talked about each of these different elements, academics, career management, leadership, student life, in, uh, in singular items, but I've shared that there's uh, this interconnectedness. And one of the realities of our experience and something that's truly distinctive about the Warren experience is for every single one of our students, you're actually gonna have an advisor in each of these areas who are in communication um, with one another about you as a student and every member of your cluster. We call this your advising support network. And this network of advisors are all helping to support, make sure that each one of our students, again, is reaching their goals based on their motivations, the skills and the knowledge that they most desire. So while they'll make sure that you don't have any missteps along the way and support you in that area, they're also gonna encourage your involvement across the board there, understanding how all parts of this uh, ASN group, this network, are all developing our students meaningfully during their two-year program. I shared earlier about the importance of our alumni network and the fact that we have near uh, over 99,000 living alumni. But once you leave Wharton, it's beyond just the network that you're forming and part of. You're actually going to have the opportunity to stay involved with Wharton and continue learning, whether it's through our executive education courses, where every seven years you actually get a free credit to come back to campus to be involved and learn. You Every year you'll have free access to different webinars and other opportunities for continued learning about different industries, growing industries, as well as other social opportunities between our global clubs and the global forums and reunions that we host. So that way your degree, even though it is an expense early on, it's a big investment, that investment always carries this ability to continue learning even after the time you're, you've left the campus. I'm gonna go over really quickly, uh, just some high level parts about our upcoming deadlines and what our application process looks like. Um, but recognizing the amount of time I've spoken, I wanna make be mindful that I'll probably land on this side, open up to conversations and questions, and we can always follow up about the application just sometime in the future. Um, this upcoming year, this upcoming year, we'll have our uh, three different rounds as normal. So September 15th will be our round one. Round two will be a January 5th deadline. And round three will and our MOLIS deadline, that advanced access deadline, will both be on March 31st. Um, just so you know about our program, round one and round two are effectively exactly the same in terms of admit, uh, admissibility and the quality of our applicants and who comes in. And we try to enroll our class or nearly enroll our entire class through those first two rounds. So my recommendation to you, at least from a Warren perspective is, if you're planning to apply this upcoming year, apply in round one or round two. Um, round three is subject to the enrollment that occurs in the first two rounds and sometimes it, your, uh, the admissibility is challenged by being impacted by the enrollment in the first two. So apply in round one or round two. When you submit your application, which will become available as uh, probably towards the middle or end of July, you'll be reviewed for admission. Uh, our full committee reviews and independent reads, and then we come together, we interview a small portion of our uh, of our group uh, through a team-based discussion process, which reflects kind of the learning environment that you'd see with your learning team. And decisions are obviously released after that time. So I'm gonna open up the floor for questions at this point, and obviously all the other application tips, you can remain in touch with our entire team about, uh, but between myself and Marcy, we're gonna be around for the next uh, 15, 20 minutes for questions. Awesome. Uh, so Siddharth, thank you for the question. Um, I see, oh, uh, looks like this question came from Advat. Uh, so if the situation remains as is, are there plans to move all classes to online programs and how does that impact the curriculum? Um, so this is a, a, a great question and something that every school is currently grappling with. I'm actually gonna defer on this space because our team, uh, so I'll say it from the University of Pennsylvania space, which Wharton is part of, uh, the university has not yet made its final decision. 
Um, what I can say for this upcoming year, the decisions that have been made are that our preterm, which is typically held in person in August, has been moved to an online capacity. Um, but we're currently, uh, our program is currently figuring out what are the best next steps to make sure that our students and all uh, members of our community are healthy. And we're hoping, we're optimistic that there could be some hybrid form, but no decision has been made in uh, totality about that. Uh, next question is, do you think the admissions committee uh, will change the proportion of international students for the class of 2023, considering the uh, current climate? Um, and uh, Marcy, I'll encourage you to certainly chime in as well, but I'll say from the, on our end, from the full-time MBA standpoint, about a third of our class has always come, or recently come from uh, international populations outside of the US. And we are not going to allow a change of uh, dynamics around the, the world geopolitically and obviously from a uh, uh, public health standpoint impact that of the importance of having international exposure both within the program and for our students outside while always keeping in mind safety so um, we are not planning to change the proportion of international students because we think that there's incredible value to having students from around the world come in and that's one of the highlights of our program um, obviously marcy from somebody who leads the the lauder institute which is uh has such great international exposure i'd be curious what your thoughts are even broader muted jake can you hear me i can okay uh, we have no one can you hear me yes we have no intentions of changing the composition of the program uh, at this point. And part of our program involves time overseas for the various programs. So we are very hopeful that uh, this is going to be possible. But stay tuned. Awesome. Awesome. Thank you. Uh, so the next question is, is uh, whether or not the full-time MBA program requires an internship as part of the program. And if that is the case, uh, to describe the process and the timing of the internship between the two years. Uh, so at this juncture, we do not require an internship as part of the program. We see the vast majority of our students do get involved with an internship at some point, and that typically occurs um, in, in the summer in between their first year and their second year of the program. And our career management office is, again, providing skills and development and helping secure those opportunities for our students as one resource, as well as helping them connect to other members of our uh, network and encouraging them how to use their own networks. Um, but at this moment, we do not require it because there are some other really meaningful and powerful opportunities. Some students go on and even initiate and start uh, their own ventures in that in between their first and second years and that could be just as important to them as an internship itself um, so it's not currently a requirement next question from justin are uh says that your traits are stated as impactful leadership strong analytical skills and an ability to collaborate how do you assess these traits from the application resumes essays and interviews um, Marcy, I've been speaking. Is there, do you want to start with this one and I can follow up? Okay. Um, the Lauder Institute requires a second essay where we assess people's international experience. Everybody is read with an equal weight on all those characteristics. So we want to make sure you can do well with the academics. We want to know what you've done on an extracurricular basis. Uh, we want to know that you understand what you think it's a good fit for you. There are no right answers, honestly. Um, we don't we couldn't script a right answer so that we look at everybody equally and have a very interesting and uh, interesting classes as a result of it for water some international experience is 
necessary and the ability to speak a second language. Awesome. Uh, thanks for that, Marcy. And the, the only thing I'll add to that previous question is just in addition that um, even though we highlight those ideas between analytical capacities, leadership development, collaboration, um, the things that we're actively looking at are those three elements as it relates to your experience and what you've done thus far from a curricular standpoint. So your academic potential from a community potential, we're looking for people who can make impact and add to the communities that we are involved in, um, as well as success in their careers. And for us, every single question we ask in our application process across our entire application is um, actually pretty intentional. So we've done back testing. So we will see, um, based from our students who have gone through our application process, obviously, we follow them through their MBA experience and then their early careers. And then we have actually found ways to uh, connect that information together. So that way we can, we've actually found what different experiences and what different skills and what different capacities people have in the application process that is uh, statistically reliable and valid in terms of their ability to be successful later on. So weights don't control our process, but we are using back information, so historical information from our uh, current students and alumni to inform how we're able to identify what skills and what development areas are really powerful. So that's where that analytical, quantitative and qualitative and analytical abilities are powerful, your uh, strong opportunities to can engage and co collaborate with other people, which we find both through your resume and your essays and your recommenders, as well as our team-based discussion, which is in itself a collaborative experience. And every other part is helping inform that future. From my just to my advice is when you look at your warrant application, if you think about all the materials in informing us of how you can achieve in our classroom how you can achieve in our community and how you plan to achieve and grow in your career, you will put yourself in a really good position. And that's, those are the three areas that you should be thinking about when applying to Wharton. The next question is what sort of information is too outdated to include in your application? Um, so for instance, uh, Harrison shares that he uh, received an Eagle Scout award in 2011, which obviously had a ton of work to it. Um, so is that too old? And uh, this is a great question. And every single person and every single experience is a little bit different. So I will say that I would not prioritize information that's nearly a decade old in your application. A lot of what we're seeking, should, the uh, foundation and the majority of what you discuss and emphasize in your application should be pretty uh, relevant and uh, recent. But that doesn't go to say that there might have been, there might be some really meaningful experience that you've had earlier in your life that we do want to learn about. So again, let's say on your resume, I wouldn't take up more than a very small bullet point or just a brief note on your resume to talk about some sort of experience that happened a decade ago necessarily. But I think there are ways that you can identify and list different things. We have an honors section, honors award and recognition section in our application that outside of your resume could be an opportunity to share some of these really important and meaningful experiences that could have happened a decade, a decade plus ago. Um, but I want you to think about focusing on the most proximate experiences throughout your full-time career, um, full-time professional career. Um, so there's a question about uh, saying that there's a possibility that the OPT policy will change, making it difficult for international students to get a job in the U.S. Also, some plan to work overseas. In these cases, how can the school help them? Um, so this is a great question. And our career management is not limited to just opportunities in the U.S. And our entire program works very closely with um, a resource on campus that's part of the broader university, but has a, a strong relationship with the Warren MBA program because of our international um, exposure, both for students coming in and where students desire to go afterwards. So ISSS, the International Scholar and Student Services um, program, has a number of advisors that we work very closely with to make sure that we are aware of how different uh, visa-based policies impact our students' abilities to get jobs and internships, as well as where they land afterwards. So we want you to know that 
we have the confidence in our programs and our relationships and knowledge around all these different areas that no matter the, the changing dynamics that exist, we will be able to provide real information to our students and real support because we are actively working with those to make sure that uh, regardless of the current policy, we are providing the right support to our students. A uh, question from Nikhil asks that, uh, can you please tell me if the Warren Advanced Access and Advanced Access Program MBA is good for someone who wants to go into healthcare management, shifting from medical medical school. Um, so I appreciate that question. So the Advanced Access Program, our deferred enrollment program, is designed for individuals who have gone directly from their undergraduate uh, degree into their uh, into a into the workforce or who are going directly from uh, their undergrad, their BS or their bachelor's degree into a graduate program, a master's program uh, directly out of undergrad without having attained full-time work experience first. Um, it's for those who are going into a four year medical school program and who then require a follow-up into fellowships, uh, you technically do are you are technically eligible for the program, but I want you to think about like how, at what point in time is it most meaningful to have the MBA? And we actually have a, one of the uh, joint programs that we have is an MBA MD program, which for both students at the University of Pennsylvania Medical School or other students in their second year of their, sorry, in the third year and fourth year of their MD when they're in residency and spending time there, they will actually join on the MBA at that time which applying to the advanced access program wouldn't allow for. So there's different junctures in which uh, the MBA might play a role. And if you ever have questions about uh, the advanced access or eligibility, you can always email our office and we can talk more about that. Uh, this is a great question from Marcy. So Marcy, uh, somebody is sharing that they intend to enjoy all the possibilities of campus life, participating in different clubs and conferences. Is it possible to do all of those things while experiencing the Lauder program? Hey, hey Marcy, you're, you're muted. Can you, uh, can you unmute yourself and start again? from that some of your credit responsibility it's still muted no marcy i i can hear you again can you hear me i'm I sorry can hear you. yeah no problem um, can you start again you can fully participate okay you can fully participate a little bit less yeah, the um, the Lauder Institute begins in May, so that you have to then you take two extra credits per semester. But our students are very involved in conferences, leadership, social life. Know what you want out of the school before you come. You can't come in thinking, "Let me figure it out when I get there." But that's true for everybody at Wharton. So, yes, indeed. It's well worth the extra time. You make choices anyway. It's like, like a smorgasbord. When time you get, get down to reality, even just thwarting you everything. But read more about Lauder and get... I'm finished talking. <laughs> okay. So some of the things that Marcy uh, 
added towards the back half kind of cut out. So just in case anybody didn't hear them fully, I just want to reiterate that uh, Marcy said like, yes, you can be fully involved in the entire program. And Mar I heard the word smorgasbord come out, uh, which always makes me laugh because it is so true to our program. So if you're in Lauder, um, you see the, the war and opportunities as a smorgasbord and you can still be engaged and involved and really active in uh, contributing members and, and leaders within the entire program. Um, so uh, the next question is with respect to round one and round two admissions cohorts, do you focus on taking the same number from each, the same percentage from each? Is there any advantage to a particular round? Um, so we, uh, for round one and round two, again, our application numbers tend to be just about the same in those. The diversity of the class, the industry experience tend to be pretty similar in many ways. Um, so in effect, applying in round one and round two is exactly the same. There's not an advantage to applying in round one or round two or round two versus round one. But I would encourage ind individuals who are planning to go into uh, a full-time MBA program for the following year to apply um, in either round one or round two. Round three, I would say is reserved. Like let's say you're planning to apply in two years and something uh, unexpected comes up over the course of that year. Um, that's when round three could be a great catch opportunity. Um, and it's designed for people who, you know, aren't, weren't expecting to apply to, to Wharton um, earlier in the year, but then later realized that it was a great time that they could jump in um, and to apply come that year's end. And that's why that round is a little bit lesser because again, it's a little bit dependent on the enrollment elsewhere. But the difference between round one and round two um, is negligible. You, they're effectively the same exact uh, admissions cohorts in terms of admit rate and the number of people who are coming in class, the number of applications relative to the round. Uh, there's a question about, is there an advantage for applicants who went to Penn as an undergraduate or graduate student or who have completed an advanced, an advanced degree at another university? Um, so my answer to that is, is no. Obviously, like there's uh, a, having exposure to the University of Pennsylvania previously sometimes gives people some background and more information, and they just are more aware of how the institution operates. But that's an exposure benefit, and it's nothing that anybody who's coming from outside of the institution can't learn through our website and the opportunities. So again, it's it's all about like how you research and find your ability to, to make meaningful alignment and connections to our program when you're going through the application process. There's not an inherent advantage for people who are coming from Penn undergraduate or graduate wise or from another institution. What we encourage you to do is be able to identify what your motivations are, what you're hoping to gain out of an MBA. And then if you can make real connections to so the Wharton MBA program, and any one of our joint degrees like water, then you're putting yourself in a really good position to succeed. Uh, so it looks like there's another question uh, that says, which test score does Warren prefer between the GMAT and the GRE? I will say we don't have any preference. So uh, if GMAT's the right test for you, apply GMAT. If GRE is the right test for you, apply with the GRE. And uh, obviously we understand that the current dynamics um, are challenging and a lot of people are forced to take an at-home version. So whatever allows you to have the most success is the right time. Uh, I think this is our last question. Uh, so from Ivan, he asked for letters of recommendation. What is your thought on someone who is switching jobs and doesn't have enough time with the current supervisor? This is a, a great question. And um, you do not need to ask your current supervisor to be one of your letters of recommendation. Uh, it obviously can be, but whether it's you choose not to because you just started a new role and you don't think that person knows you quite as well, or it could be disadvantageous for you in your work environment. Some work cultures aren't as encouraging of an MBA pursuit or maybe an MBA pursuit at that time. So if you feel that your current supervisor or current colleague is not the right person around to be happy, you can always ask somebody else that you've worked with previously, maybe a client that you trust and respect. And the two questions we ask uh, of all individuals who write on your, uh, on your behalf are, uh, what makes you confident that this individual uh, would contribute to the community? 
and what makes you confident this individual will, will be uh, successful throughout their careers. And if you think about two people from your background, hopefully with uh, some recent experience and with some examples, can talk about how you engage and collaborate with others and how you will be able to achieve in your career, um, anybody can really satisfy that. So why it's obviously a great opportunity if a current uh, supervisor works for you, but there's a number of reasons why that might not be the case. So please feel free uh, to ask whoever you see is most fitting. Um, and we're excited to learn about you, uh, that aspect of you at that time. I wanna say one more time, just thank you to the GMAT Club. Thank you to all of you for participating. Um, we are really excited to get to know you and obviously you can feel free to reach out to us at any time. So have a great day, enjoy the rest of the programming and we'll talk soon.